By the end of the Neogene period, the Earth had plunged into an ice age. More water circulating in the atmosphere, drawn from an Atlantic Ocean, resulted in high snowfall on Antarctica, and the ice sheet increased to its present size. As Earth cooled and became drier, grasslands spread at the expense of forests. Many large and small herbivorous mammals and their predators had to adapt to a demanding life on the open plains. Neogene, meaning newborn, is a period when many modern animals evolve. Major features of today's world geography were also taking shape. The Indian plate continued to plow beneath Asia, pushing the Himalayas even higher, and closing the Great Tethys Ocean. Many changes have contributed to the cooling of the Earth, which transformed ecosystems. As forests have way to grasslands in mid-latitudes, hoofed mammals developed teeth suitable for grazing, and long legs to gallop away from predators. The newly formed Panama Isthmus also affected the world's climate, by altering ocean current circulation. It linked the American continents, allowing fauna and flora that were once separated to migrate freely. During the early Neogene, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current became firmly established, isolating Antarctica as a cold region. The change from warm to cooler water is reflected in a change from carbonates to silica-rich sediments. The colder conditions lowered sea levels by trapping water in the polar regions. Although the climate warmed for short period in the early Pliocene, it then began to cool again, with large ice sheets forming in the northern hemisphere. This changing climate required new strategies for survival, SCH as herd behavior and seasonal migrations in hoofed mammals, and burrowing and hibernations in early rodents. This was a time of continued global cooling. The first ice sheets in Antarctica were beginning to spread about 25 million years ago, although this was followed by a warming event by 14 million years ago. However, permanent ice sheets draped the Antarctic continent, and invertebrates adapted accordingly. During the Neogene many echinoids living in cold Antarctic waters, where growth and development were slow. W developed marsupiae or brood pouches. This is an adaptation for incubating fertilized egg switch developed directly without the free swimming larval stage. The marsupiae form deep depressions on the surface of the echinoids. Meandrina is a colonial scleractinian coral that is often found in reefs. It is formed by budding from the initial individual coral like the skeleton of a polyp. The top of the colony is divided into meandering ridges and valleys and the polyps the individual members of the colony are housed in the cup-shaped depressions of the valleys. The partitions that divide the body cavity of the coralite are fairly straight and long and those from adjacent coralites are often in line. The axial ends of the septa form the axial plate that runs along the center of the horizontally elongated coralites. Modern species of meandrina include the brain coral so called because the meandering coralites resemble the surface of a human brain. Sphenotrochus is a small solitary conical coral that in life was entirely covered by the polyp body and cross-section the skeleton is elliptical. The thin partitions of septa that divide the inside of the coralite are fused together around the outside to form the coralite wall. It survives to the present day it usually lives in water around 20 to 275 meters deep. The Bryozoan Meandropora formed large rounded colonies which were composed of radiating cylindrical clusters of small tubular structures called autozoetia. These clusters divided and rejoined to produce a distinctive pattern on the surface of the colony. The autozoetia were very long with thin wall sand some were partitioned with diaphragms. They housed its soft-bodied feeding individuals. Each autozoid possessed a feeding organ called a lophophore which consisted of a ring of tentacles surrounding the mouth. Biflustra is a chylostome bryozoan with a hard skeleton that is composed of calcium carbonate it forms encrusting flat tenodore bifoliate colonies. Tubular chambers called autozoetia house the small soft-bodied individuals of the colony. Each autozoid had a ring of tentacles around its mouth known as a lophophore. Small, hair-like organs on the tentacles create a flow of water to drive food particles toward the mouth. 
When the autozoids are not feeding, their tentacles can be withdrawn into the autozoetia for protection. This gastropod has a conical spire, with distinct spines that stick out around the shell and developed as part of its spiral ornament. There is one row of spines where the whorls meet each other and another below it at the shoulder of the whorl. Below the shoulder spines are five spiral ribs that have no spines. Lower down the whorl are four more rows of spirally developed spines. There are spines right back to the part of the shell that developed when the animal was a juvenile. The shell opening is long and thin with a long anterior canal. This would have housed the animal's inhalant siphon, which brought water into the shell. Modern species of this genus predate marine worms and are found living in tropical zones worldwide. Viviparis is a freshwater gastropod. The whorls are rounded and convex, and have well-marked growth lines. Mature examples have some thickening on the outer lip, and some have similar earlier thickenings that suggest a slowing of the growth rate, perhaps due to environmental conditions. Unlike some other freshwater gastropods, it is not air-breathing. Instead, it has a single gill, which suggests it is derived from marine, gill-bearing ancestors. This pointed, multi-world gastropod is best described as turreted. The shell is ornamented with sinuous, vertical ribs, and there is a faint spiral band about a third of the way down the side of each whorl. Modern species vary in appearance and size, with some species reaching 25 centimeters long. Living species are all carnivores and often select a single species of invertebrate to feed on. Many bury themselves in soft sediment during the day and emerge to hunt at night, it is possible that the extinct neogene species of Terebra behaved in a similar way. The whorls of this gastropod are broad with each one overlapping about three quarters of the following whorl. Some spiral ornamentation can be seen on the upper part of the outer whorl. The area surrounding the shell opening is called the mouth border, and there is a deep notch in this where th. E. anterior inhalant siphon would have protruded to draw in water. Modern species of the genus are carnivores that feed on echinoids by boring into their shells with a tongue-like, toothed redula. Neogene ostria were very similar to the living oysters that belong to the same genus. Like other members of the oyster group, the valves vary greatly in shape. The left valve is convex and often strongly ribbed, while the right valve is flat and lacks ribs. Unlike most bivalves, Austria incubated its eggs within the mantle cavity, the space between the body and the body wall. When the young were finally released after 6 to 18 days, they already had a minute bivalved shell. A museum is a large, smooth, almost circular bivalve from the same family a modern scallop. The main difference is that a museum's valves are virtually smooth, whereas scallop valves are ribbed. Its thin shell has two prominent, ur-like extensions on either side of the beak, with one slightly larger. Fine growth lines cover the shell surface, and faint radial striations are also visible. At first sight, Anadera looks like a modern cockle, with strong, radially arranged ribs crossed by growth lines inside, however, it differs greatly from modern cockles. Beneath the forward-facing beak of each valve is a long, striated groove that, in life, houses the long ligament responsible for opening the shell. Below the ligament groove is a long, straight hinge line, with many, almost vertical teeth and sockets that help the shell stay together when shut. There are two scars, where the muscles that controlled the movement of the valves would have been attached. And in. Conspicuous line between the scars is where the mantle was attached. Shizaster is a heart-shaped burrowing sea urchin with five well-marked ambulacral areas or petals on its upper surface where its tube feet protrude. The rear two petals are far shorter than the front three. The middle front ambulacral area is set in a deep groove that reaches down to the lower surface in the mouth. When viewed from the side the shell is quite high and there is a slight overhand at the rear above the anal opening. 
Scatella was a medium-sized flattened burrowing sea urchin with internal pillars that strengthened its shell there were give petal-shaped ambulacral areas on its lower surface where its many tube feet emerged. Around the edge of these areas were pairs of pores. Each outer pore had a slit-like appearance. The mouth was located in the center of the animal's lower surface and well-marked food grooves ed directly to it. Where these food grooves crossed the junction between the upper and lower ambulacral areas. Its anal opening was also positioned underneath it about midway between the back margin of the shell and the mouth in the center of the upper surface was the gonopores. Scatella is one of many echinoid fossils that are sometimes referred to as sand dollars although the sand dollars found by beachcombers today are usually the shells of modern echinoid species. From the start of the Neogene period 23 million years ago the world's climate became gradually cooler and drier. This caused deserts and grasslands to advance across much of the continental land surface. Predators and prey either adapted to the new conditions of became extinct. Many mammal groups colonized new continents during the Neogene crossing land bridges created by lowered sea levels and the collision of land masses. Ancestral camels originated in North America but crossed to Eurasia about 7 million years ago where they later evolved into dromedaries and Bactrian camels. Movements to South America about 3 million years ago gave rise to llamas guanacos and vicuñas. The expansion of grasslands gave rise to a new mode of feeding among herbivores, grazing. Even toad ungulates especially ruminants were better suited to eating the coarse grasses low in nutritional value than than odd toad ungulates due to their more highly developed stomachs. Ruminants have four chambered stomachs with microbes that digest cellulose. They also regurgitate and retchew tough plant material before swallowing it again. These adaptations led to a dramatic diversification of artiodactyls such as cattle and antelopes during the Miocene at the expense of parasodactyls such as horses rhinos roses and tapirs. The grazes began to herd together for safety while feeding and traveling on their seasonal migrations to find fresh pasture. They evolved to become bigger and faster to evade their predators in turn carnivores evolved strategies such as pack and pursuit hunting to help them catch their fast-moving prey. Both modern lineages of whales, the Mysticetosaur baleen whales and the Odontocetes the toothed whales, existed at the start of the Neogene toward the end of the Miocene representatives of several modern whale dolphin and porpoise families had appeared alongside some families that are now extinct. The first true seal sea lions and walruses also evolved in the Miocene and the herbivorous Cyrenians diversified. All of these marine mammals were preyed upon by the giant shark Atotus megalodon. Weighing around 50 tons or more Atotus was the largest predatory shark that ever lived the species, Megalodon, is named for its huge triangular teeth measuring up to 17 cm high. These teeth have serrations running down both cutting edge censuring and efficient slicing action cut marks in bones and isolated teeth lying next to fossil carcasses show that Megalodon must have preyed upon a wide range of whales dolphins seals giant turtles and fish. It probably ambushed its prey by attacking them at speed once disabled the prey could be processed using its huge jaws and colossal bite force. The traditional view is that it is a close relative of the modern great white shark. There are certainly many similarities between the teeth of these two species and in the absence of a complete specimen megalodon is usually reconstructed using the great white as a model. However it is now clear that megalodon belongs to a different genus. Meliobatus was a common stingray during the Neogene. Me equals 0.4 s, greater than at least 11 Meliobatus species survive today and are found worldwide, known as the eagle rays. Many specimens of extinct species have been unearthed in Pliocene deposits in North Carolina. However, other finds in North America, Africa and Europe show that Meliobatus was also around in the Miocene and perhaps extends back as far as the Eocene.
Gavilosicus was an extinct gharial from the late Oligocene to early Pliocene of North America, and the early Miocene of Europe. Like living gharials, it had a very long skull with a narrow snout that it used to catch fish. Gavilosicus fossils have been found in coastal deposits, which suggests that it lived in estuaries or shallow seas, where it could have fed on a variety of different types of fish. Although living gharials are restricted to India and southeastern Asia, fossils of different species found in Florida, Austria and Georgia suggest that the group was once distributed in swampy and coastal habitats all over the tropical regions of the world. Modern-day members of the Philocrocorax genus are the cormorants and shags. There are 36 living species of these medium-sized, fish-eating seabirds. A similar number of extinct species from all over the world have been described. It hunted new diving and had a flexible neck and long bill for catching fish. The tip of its upper bill was slightly hooked to cling onto slippery prey. Historically, cormorants were thought to be the shoreline cousins of ravens. However, Philocrocorax belongs to the Pelicaniforms, a group of water birds that includes pelicans and gannets. Argentavis is by far the largest flying bird to have ever lived. It resembled a gigantic condor, with a wingspan of 8 meters, a large specimen would have weighed 80 kilograms. This is more than double the wingspan and five times the weight of the Andean condor, the largest bird flying today. Argentavis had strong legs and wide feet, so it was able to walk easily. Its bill was long with a hooked tip, like that of an eagle, so it could rip open almost any carcass. It was almost certainly a scavenger, searching for carrion as it soared in the air, before landing and driving off other large predators from their kills. This giant of the sky would have had to cov her a vast territory to find enough food to sustain itself. Thylacosmolus was a large predatory marsupial that was about the size of today's jaguar, like the saber-toothed cats such as Smilodon, to which it was unrelated, it had long, sabe-shaped upper canine teeth. This is a classic example of convergent evolution. However, in Thylacosmolus, these canines grew continuously throughout its life. When the mouth was closed, the sabers were protected by a pair of scabbard-like flanges in the lower jaw. It was the last of the line of marsupial carnivores that diversified in isolation in South America. When North and South America became connected via the Panama Land Bridge, around 3 million years ago, placental carnivores, including Smilodon, moved into South America and took their place. Dano Galurix was a giant, spineless, hairy hedgehog that lived on Gargano during the late Miocene, when it was an island off the coast of Italy. Like today's hedgehogs, to which it was related, it fed on a mixture of insects, snails and other invertebrates. However, it was huge for an insectivore, weighing as much as a large cat, and its large body size would have enabled it to hunt birds and small mammals as well. Dano Galurix is a classic example of how small mammals tend to grow large on islands where they do not face competition from larger predators. However, the giant barn owl Tito Gigantia also lived on Gargano during the late Miocene and may even have preyed upon Dano Galurix. Anali Arctos is the earliest known relative of the pinnipeds. Its fossils have been found in early Miocene rocks in California and Oregon. Like later seals and sea lions, its limbs were modified into crude flippers, although they were not as highly specialized as those of modern pinnipeds. Anali Arctos used both front and hind limbs for swimming, modern sea lions use just their forelimbs for swimming, and all four flippers to move on land, while modern seals use their hind flippers for swimming and are less mobile on land. Although it had large eyes, sensitive whiskers, and good underwater hearing like its living descendants, its teeth were more primitive and resembled those of its bear-like ancestors. It ate fish but, unlike seals, co. Old not eat its catch while swimming, instead it had to drag its prey to the shore to tear it apart. Alidesmus was an early relative of sea lions and, like them, it swam with its forelimbs and could rotate its hind limbs forwards to help it walk in a shuffling fashion on land. It had a long, slender skull like that of a modern leopard seal, but its teeth were blunt with bulbous crowns, more suited for catching fish and squid, which it would then have swallowed whole as modern sea lions do. 
its large eyes would have helped it see while hunting underwater. Alidesmus showed a wide range in sizes between males and females, suggesting that the large bulls, which weighed up to 360 kilograms would have guarded a harem of cows. Saratogoulus was a burrowing rodent distinguished by a pair of straight horns on its nose. It was roughly the size of a modern marmot but more closely resembled a gopher, with its strong forelimbs equipped with huge claws, the role of the horns has been much debated. It has been suggested that they were used for digging, but they were not in the correct position. Both males and females had horns, so they are unlikely to have been used for display during courtship. It is now thought that the horns were used as defensive weapons when the animal was out in the open, away from the safety of its burrow. Paleocaster was one of the earliest known relatives of living beavers, living between the early Oligocene and the early Miocene. Fossils have been found in western USA and Japan. Although related to beavers, it was not an aquatic tree cutter. Instead, it was a terrestrial burrower, about the size and shape of a modern marmot. Stenomalus was a humpless camel that lived in North America between the late Oligocene and the early Miocene. Although it was a true camel, it was small, reaching only 1, 5 meters tall at the shoulder. Its legs and body were delicate and slender, like those of a modern gazelle. Its most remarkable features were its elongated, high-crowned molars, with deep roots that reached the base of the jaw and the top of the skull. These must have been used to eat very show signs of extreme wear during the life of the animal. Monoceros was a small rhinoceros that has been f. found in the early Miocene deposits of western North America especially Nebraska and Wyoming. It was a true rhinoceros but is more slender in its build than modern members of the group. It was also smaller and only reached the size of a large pig. Males had two bony horns positioned side by side on the tip of the nose but the females were hornless. Teleoceras was a large rhinoceros with a single small horn on the tip of its nose it comes from Miocene deposits of North America. Although it is a true rhinoceros its body plan is similar to that of a hippopotamus with short stumpy limbs a massive barrel chest and a skull with high crowned cheek teeth. Teleoceras fossils are found in large numbers in many ancient river and pond deposits on the high plains of western North America. One such place is Ashfall Fossil Bed State Park. Here hundreds of complete skeletons are found some specimens have grass seeds fossilized in their throats confirming that it was a grass eater. Paraceratherium was a giganticornless rhinoceros from the late Oligocene to early Miocene of Asia. Its immense skull alone was 1, 3 meters long and had two conical upper tusks flaring lower tusks and retracted nasal openings suggesting a fleshy proboscis. Its immense size and long neck allowed Paraceratherium to feed on the tops of trees like a giraffe does today. Despite its huge size it still had the long toes and limbs of its ancestors the Hyracodonts and not the stumpy toes found in similarly huge beasts such as elephants. It was the largest land mammal that ever lived reaching 5, 5 meters at the shoulder 8 meters in length and weighing about 15 tons. Paraceratherium, like many rhinoceros and tapirs, probably had a long prehensible lip that could wrap around branches and strip leaves from the trees that it fed upon. Tapirs and rhinoceros have the nasal bones retracted fat back on the skull, leaving a large nasal notch where the complex muscles attached to manipulates their lip or proboscis. Calicotherium was a perissodactyl that lived between the late Oligocene and the early Pliocene in Eurasia and Africa it looked somewhat like a large horse except that it had claws on its toes rather than hooves. The purpose of these claws on a hoofed mammal was a puzzle for some time but it is now thought that they were used to hook branches and pull them. In addition its front limbs were far longer than its back legs and it had features on the hands and pelvic bones that suggested that it knuckle walked much like a gorilla does today. Me equals 0.4 s, 
greater than when it was not on the move Calicotherium sat for long periods of time on its haunches feeding on vegetation. The relationships of Chalicotheres have been a mystery for many years. Recent evidence has shown that they are cousins of the tapers but when the claws of Calicotherium were first discovered they were thought to be a type of carnivore. During the Miocenath world's climate became drier and forests thinned out into grasslands. Marichipus was a primitive horse that lived in large herds on these new plains it had evolved from its shy forest dwelling ancestors to become a long legged fast running grazer similar to today's equines. It was the first equine to have a single hoofed middle toe on each foot. Although two other toes flanked the middle onine most species these were only long enough to touch the ground while it was galloping. Descendants of Marichipus include Pleohippus and today's Equus species. Pleohippus was an early one-toed horse that still had two vestigial side toes on each hoof. It was about the size of a zebra and slightly smaller than most species of modern horses. For many years it was thought that Pleohippus was the ancestors of Equus but it has deep pockets on the facial region and its teeth were strongly curved while those of Equus are straight. Scientists currently think that Equus is descended from Dino Hippus and Pleohippus as part of a lineage of horses that included Calipus and Astrohippus. Dinotherium was a relative of the mastodonts with tusks that curved down and back from the front of the lower jaw. The purpose of its tusks is still controversial but it is likely they were used for hooking onto branches to drag them down and make it easier to reach the leaves. Dinotherium was slightly larger than today's African elephant weighing about 14 tons which makes it the third largest land mammal that ever lived its huge skull was almost one meter long. The nasal bones are very deep suggesting that the trunk was wider and shorter than that of today's elephants. This four-tusked mastodont first evolved in Africa during the early Miocene it became the first mastodont to escape its homeland migrating to Eurasia and North America where it flourished. It was about the size of a small elephant, with a long, flat skull, a large pair of long upper tusks that extended straight out, and a smaller pair of shovel-shaped tusks that grew out of the lower jaw. These lower tusks were probably used to scrape up vegetation and strip bark and leaves off trees. Gomphotheres were the ancestors from which mammoths evolved during the Neogene. The sole living Oryctherapus species is the Aardvark. Not only is it the only species in the genus, it is also the only survivor in the entire mammal order Tubula dentata. The Aardvark lives in sub-Saharan Africa, where, for protection from predators, it sleeps during the day and comes out at night to feed on insects. It uses its sharp front claws to tear open termite nests, then laps up the insects with its extremely long tongue. Fossil relatives of the aardvark include Oryctherapus godri, which has been found on the Greek island of Samos. With its robust limbs and skull, long tail, and wolf-like teeth, Amphicyon looked like a large dog with the build of a bear, which is why it is also known as bear dog. Being the largest predator in the middle Miocene of North America, it was able to kill and eat almost any animal, and also drive off other predators to scavenge their kills. It became extinct in North America, but persisted a little longer in Europe being driven to extinction by true bears. Proconsul was the size of a modern baboon or gibbon, and was the first fossil anthropoid to be found in Africa. It was positioned close to where the Old World monkeys and apes split apart on the primate family tree. Like Old World monkeys, Proconsul had thin tooth enamel, a narrow chest, short forelimbs, and a light build. This tells us that it was primarily a tree dweller, living on soft fruits. However, it also shared some similarities with apes, having a large brain, ape-like elbows, and no tail.
Dryopithecus was an ape the size of a monkey with a build like a chimpanzee. Its body proportions, and the shape of the limbs and wrists, show that it could walk on all four like a chimpanzee. The limbs also suggested that. It spent most of its life in trees, swinging like a gibbon. Dryopithecus had molars with thin enamel, suggesting it ate soft fruit, and the same pattern of cusps as the great apes and hominids.